At 11,000 feet above sea level, most engines lose power and winter lasts half the year. And on the I-70 corridor, the Continental Divide here isn't just a ridge line. It's a solid wall of granite that blocked any direct highway across Colorado for decades. In the 1960s, engineers decided the only solution was to go straight through it. But when they drilled their first test bore, they hit a fault zone so unstable it crushed steel supports and squeezed the tunnel walls inward. For almost five years, nearly 6,000 workers fought their way under the mountain, carving out almost two miles of tunnels at an elevation where every step forward came with new challenges. When the Eisenhower Tunnel opened in 1973, it immediately became the highest point on the entire interstate system. Welcome to Beyond the Exit. I'm Scott. And this is our first episode of what we're calling Engineering the Impossible, where we explore some of the most astounding feats ever accomplished for the purpose of building a roadway. We're going to talk about it today as we go Beyond the Exit. When you drive I-70 West out of Denver today, the route feels very straightforward. You follow Clear Creek through the old mining towns, climb past Loveland Ski Area, and disappear into the mountain at the Eisenhower and Johnson Tunnels. That tunnel system now moves millions of vehicles each year and requires constant industrial-scale upkeep. From giant ventilation caverns to a 24-7 operations staff that keeps the highest point on the interstate system open through some of the harshest weather in the country. But for most of Colorado's history, there was nothing straightforward about crossing this stretch of the Rockies. The mountains here formed a true barrier, steep, narrow, and avalanche prone, and brutally exposed in winter. Before engineers could tunnel under the divide, travelers had to rely on a pair of high passes that were often slow, treacherous, or completely closed. Each pass carried its own set of challenges, and not surprisingly, its own loyal supporters. Before the Tunnels To understand why Colorado ultimately decided to build a tunnel at 11,000 feet, we need to look briefly at what came before it, and why neither of the old routes could possibly support a modern interstate. For most of Colorado's history, crossing the Rockies west of Denver meant choosing between two mountain passes each difficult in its own way and neither suited for the volume or reliability a modern highway would eventually demand. To the north was Berthoud Pass, reached by US-40. It began as a wagon route in the 1800s and later became one of Colorado's earliest ski hubs, complete with rope toes and early chairlifts. But the road climbed through a tight series of switchbacks and crossed more than 50 avalanche paths. Trucks crawled here and winter closures were very common and the route bent north into Middle Park, adding miles before turning west. To the south, Loveland Pass on US-6 offered the more direct line toward the Eagle River Valley and the western slope, but it did so at nearly 12,000 feet. Exposed to the brutal Seven Sisters avalanche chutes, grades were steep, curves were narrow, and older trucks frequently overheated or lost braking power on the descent. In winter, Loveland could shut down for days at a time. And while the railroad managed to find workable paths through nearby canyons, including the Moffat Tunnel Line and Rail Corridor through Glenwood Canyon, none of those alignments would be adapted into a high-speed four-lane highway. By the 1950s, both passes were already at their practical limits. The post-war surge in tourism, ski traffic, and long-haul trucking made it entirely clear a new solution was needed. A solution that didn't go around the mountains, but through them only one way through. When the interstate highway system was approved in 1956, federal planners assumed the mountain section west of Denver was too difficult and too expensive to build. On the early maps, I-70 simply stopped in Denver. Colorado pushed back on this. The state argued that a direct east-west connection to Utah was vital for commerce, tourism, and national defense. And Washington listened and actually agreed. Authorizing the extension was the easy part. Choosing where it would cross the Rockies was something else entirely. The debate grew so heated that Colorado commissioned an independent engineering study, the E. Lionel Pavlo Report, published in 1960. Its job was simple, identify every feasible alignment between Denver and the Eagle Valley and determine which route could meet full interstate standards. 
The findings of the report were blunt. No surface highway could be built to interstate geometry. The grades were too steep, the curves too tight, and the winter reliability far too poor. The only viable solution? Tunnel under the Continental Divide. When the engineers compared options, one route stood out. The straight creek alignment, roughly following US-6, was nearly 10 miles shorter than the Berthoud Corridor. That distance difference translated directly into nationwide time and fuel savings, enough, the report concluded, to justify the enormous cost of tunneling. And with that, Colorado made its choice. I-70 would follow the Loveland Corridor, enter the mountain near Strait Creek, and reappear on the western side in a straight, efficient line toward the Eagle River Valley. On paper, the decision made perfect sense. In the field, it set up one of the most difficult tunneling projects ever attempted in the United States. Carving the Divide Once engineers committed to the Straight Creek alignment, the real challenge began, figuring out how to drive almost two miles of tunnel through a mountain that was anything but predictable. Early test drilling in the 1960s revealed a mixed picture. Much of the route passed through solid granite and nice, strong, stable rock that made tunneling relatively straightforward. But roughly a quarter of the alignment crossed the Loveland Pass shear zone, a faulted belt of crushed, unstable material created by the same tectonic forces that lifted the Rockies. In that zone, the mountain didn't hold its shape. As crews advanced, the surrounding rock pushed inward, deforming steel ribs and bending heavy I-beams under pressure. Standard drilling and blasting methods simply weren't enough because the tunnel walls moved faster than the supports could be installed. To break through the shear zone, engineers shifted to a multiple drift method. Instead of excavating the full tunnel width at once, crews carved a ring of small side drifts, lined them with concrete and steel, and created a reinforced shell. Only then could miners safely remove the material from the center. It was slow, deliberate work, but it allowed the project to keep moving. Construction on the first bore, what would become the Eisenhower Tunnel, began in 1968. From that start, the elevation added its own layer of difficulty. At more than 11,000 feet, engines lost power, workers tired faster, and winter storms routinely shut down access roads. Progress often was measured in simple feet per day. Thousands of workers cycled through the site over the five-year construction period. After steady, grinding forward progress, the Eisenhower Tunnel broke through and opened fully to traffic on March 8, 1973. It immediately became the highest point on the interstate system and cut crossing times over the divide by half an hour or more. But with only one bore open, carrying two-way traffic, the tunnel quickly reached its capacity. Construction on the second tunnel, the Johnson Bore, began in 1975. With detailed knowledge of the geology and refined methods from the first bore, engineers were able to work more efficiently. The Johnson Tunnel opened in late 1979, completing the four-lane link under the Continental Divide. Truly an amazing feat to behold. But all of that came at a price. And even though the numbers sound enormous, the tunnel was still a bargain by the standards of America's biggest highway projects. The first bore cost about $100 million in 1973, and the second bore, along with the ventilation changes, buildings, and approach work, added another $162 million by 1979. Altogether, piercing the Continental Divide ended up costing the modern equivalent of nearly $1.5 billion. Now, for comparison, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel that many of you may be familiar with in Virginia Finished in 1964, cost about $200 million at the time, bringing its inflation-adjusted cost to just over $2 billion today. In other words, boring under the divide ended up costing less than building a bridge tunnel system across the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Together, the Eisenhower and Johnson tunnels marked a turning point in American highway engineering. The first time the interstate highway system crossed the backbone of the Rockies, not by going over it, but by going straight through. Behind the Concrete Curtain Building the tunnels was only the first half of the story. Keeping them open, in one of the harshest environments on the interstate system, required an entire layer of infrastructure that most drivers never notice. Above the roadway hidden behind the concrete sit massive ventilation vaults, 
stretching the length of the tunnels. These chambers house industrial scale fans capable of moving millions of cubic feet of air per minute. Their job is constant, clear exhaust, maintain visibility, and keep air quality within safe limits for both travelers and maintenance crews. All of this is monitored from a central control room. Operators track airflow, traffic speeds, lighting, temperatures, and fire detection systems in real time. A single accident, a stalled vehicle, a minor collision, or even a change in wind direction outside can require immediate adjustments. The approaches to the tunnels demand just as much attention. The 7% descent toward Silverthorne has long been one of the most challenging stretches for heavy trucks, and avalanche mitigation teams manage dozens of slide paths above the corridor. Inside the tunnels themselves, maintenance never stops. None of this is accidental. The Eisenhower and Johnson tunnels operate as a system, part roadway, part industrial facility, and part mountain weather outpost. Its network is designed to keep traffic moving through a place where nature is constantly pushing back. What the tunnels changed. Today, most of us drive through the Eisenhower and Johnson tunnels without giving them a second thought. A few minutes through the passage and we're on our way. But when the first war opened in 1973, it did far more than shorten a mountain drive. It permanently changed the relationship between Colorado's Front Range and the Western Slope. Towns that once felt isolated from Denver were suddenly a day trip away. Ski areas flourished and freight routes stabilized and a mountain barrier that defined Colorado for generations became a passageway used by millions each year. And looking back, it's clear the engineers were right about the value of this route. Early studies argued that the time savings, fuel savings, and year-round reliability would more than pay for the cost of driving a tunnel under the divide. And today's traffic proves it. As of 2025, the tunnels now carry more than 35,000 vehicles per day on average with summer and holiday peaks climbing as high as 50,000 vehicles. Now, it may not match the sheer volume of corridors like California's Grapevine or Cajon Pass, which see in excess of 100,000 vehicles per day, but it puts into perspective just how vital this four-lane link has become to travel over the Rockies. The Eisenhower and Johnson tunnels remain the literal high point of the interstate system, not because of their elevation alone, but because of what they represent. They're a reminder that the interstate network wasn't just poured across open plains. Some sections had to be engineered, inch by inch, through some of the most resistant terrain in the country. For all the challenges that came with building them, and all of the challenges that come with maintaining them, these tunnels stand as one of the most ambitious solutions ever built into the American road network, and are another great example of how engineering the impossible was made possible. Well, we hope you enjoyed our story. Maybe you're a professional driver or just a commuter and you've got a story you want to tell. Well, leave it in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, if you would, please hit the like button. That helps it go farther on YouTube. And we'd love it if you would share it with someone you think would enjoy it as well. You know, we love telling the stories from the roads that move us. And maybe that's something you enjoy too. If so, why don't you join us on this caravan and subscribe to the channel? You know, beyond the exit, we're always looking for history that's just hiding in plain sight. We know you can be other places. We're happy that you're here. We want to say thank you and God bless.